And this third aspect actually emanate from the first two distinctions and first two points of difference. That aspect is meaning of good life. What is considered to be meaning of good life and what is considered to be life satisfaction can also be different in different cultures. So, happiness is the fundamental goal of life. If this statement of Chick and Mihai is there in the, uh, in the landmark paper of positive psychology in the American psychologist 2001, the special issue, it is not so quite so simple because there are cultures and that it has been throughout the history where individual satisfaction has generally taken a back seat to the goals, purposes, priorities of large collectives. And that when emotional satisfaction has been experienced, it is often of different kind. That is, that is not derived from the internal positive emotions, but that satisfaction is derived from living according to the social order, which is typically situated within the broader cosmological framework. Why someone is doing sacrifice for teaching kids? Why someone has to sacrifice for protecting a community? Why someone has to create something where the larger members of the society can come assemble, do good things, all these are the result of selfless actions. All cultures appreciate that. If we look at most of the social development and maybe even technological development is result of some human being operating and taking pain, some, some human being actually sacrificing their personal satisfaction, sacrificing their emotional satisfaction to create something which can create eventually value for the larger society, for the larger mankind. And that is not very well captured because I may find meaning in that, but someone may claim that they find meaning in just pursuing hedonistic pleasure. So, that distinction is not there in the assessment of the well-being, in the assessment of the uh, flourishing and that is what is being pointed out by Christopher and Hickenbottom. We can understand this point by looking at some of the Indian examples. If we look at the happiness, if we look at flourishing and if we search these terms in the Indian tradition, we come across these three words, Sukha, Shanti, Ananda. Sukha word come from satisfaction of the senses. Why? Because kha reflects the indriyas, the senses, action related and perception related senses. Sense satisfaction, su upasar, sorry, su prefix reflects the positivity, the favorableness. So, convenience and pleasure experience of the senses is sukha. And you must have heard people giving blessings to their younger ones, sukhi raho. But sukha is not considered to be the ultimate aim of life. There is something higher than sukha, what we understand to be shanti. Shanti word come from the root word sham. Sham means equanimity. Sam means equanimity, sam means more calmness. Calmness of what? Calmness of negativities of life. In our tradition, we call the, the dukkha or the uh, anxieties can be because of the adhi daivik, adhi bhautik and adhyatmic reason. Adhyatmic which is higher realm of self, adhi bhautik means extended uh, uh, life of the physicality and adhi devik is the uh, my role in the larger scheme of things. Wherever there is some traction in these three aspects, anxiety emerges which result into stress. 
So, we call for Shanti. Shanti is attaining the calmness from all the three type of Dukkha. It is also and you must have noticed after the mantras we say Shanti three times Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Whether you go in north, south, western part of India, wherever there is some in all spiritual traditions this uh, practice is followed. Whenever we say Shanti three time, it is indication of Shaman or calmness or going down of the Dukkha which are of Adhidaivik nature, Adhyatmic nature and uh, Adhibhautic nature. It is also reflection of the Shanti and calmness at all three Shariras, three levels of existence of our individual self. Sthul Sharir which is physical body, Sukshmi Sharir which is subtle, which is made up of our sense of vitality, emotions, rationality and Karan Sharir which is understood to be the substratum over which all the play of life is going on. So, Shanti at all three levels. Many of you must have heard Shanti Mantra which is generally recited after all uh, yogic as well as Vedic protocols. It says Om Dyau Shanti, Antariksh Shanti, Prathvi Shanti, Rapa Shanti, Oshadaya Shanti, Vanaspataya Shanti, no stress, no anxiety, all calmness in all spheres of life, whether it is Aushadhi, whether it is medicine, whether it is universe, whether it is Antriksh, whether it is space, everywhere there is a prayer for calmness and going away of anxieties. So, this is also a reflection that attaining individual Shanti is not possible. My individual Shanti is connected to the Shanti of whole universe. So, my duty does not stop. The good life cannot be achieved just by ensuring that I get satisfaction and pleasure and all the conveniences. Until I make conscious effort, until my surroundings are also are in comfort, are in calmness, are in are not suffering from anxiety, I cannot attain that calmness. So, my Shanti is connected with the Shanti of my surroundings. That surrounding include natural environment as well as social environment. So, you can say Shanti is an inclusive term. There is no individual Shanti or individual, individual Sukh is possible, but individual Shanti is not possible. Then there is another term which is called Ananda. Ananda word comes from Nand which is means Alhad, ecstasy, and with the Upsarg with the prefix A. That Alhad is the moment of forgetfulness of self, ecstasy are the state of mind which is beyond wakefulness, which is Jagrati. It is beyond the Swapna, which is dream stage and it is, it can also be, it happens to be at the deep sleep stage and it can also be deeper than the deep sleep stage, that is Ananda. We all experience that in the deep sleep, but how it can be experienced in the wakefulness stage and how even there is a possibility of fourth stage beyond awake wakefulness, dream and sleep, that is where the real anand, the real positive experience of life occurs and that is the claim of Indian psychology, that is the objective of yoga practices that is not captured in the existing literature of positive psychology. We can take another example where Sukha and Shanti may not be there, but still they are considered to be very important pursuits of life. In order to fulfill the Kartavya duty, there are studies suggesting and our conception of the Kartavya also suggests 
that we are not having individual life experience, we are all living roles. We have roles as the member of family, as member of community, as member of larger social and environmental uh, ecosystem. So, we have kartavya towards all because they, because of all this, this life exists. And in order to following kartavya, in order to following duty, I may have to forego my pleasure. And what is appreciated in the yogic tradition or Vedic tradition is foregoing the individual pleasure for the individual kartavya. Then there is another step called sadhana. Sadhana is systematically going through the hardship to develop more self control, so that you can develop deeper shanti and people report that that will result into anand which is which is aesthetic state and which is much deeper than the sukha. In between comes term tapas. Tapas is the process of attaining that selflessness, that process of attaining that commitment for the larger purpose and if required even experiencing pain in that process, that pain is appreciated. So, these terms reflect that what is considered to be good life and what is considered to be emotional satisfaction and well-being can be different in different cultures. And because of this difference, Walsh in, in the reaction to the special issue of American psychologist wrote in 2001 that though psychologies of Buddhism and yoga lack information on the nature and treatment of major psychopathologies. However, they contain a wealth of information on exceptional psychological health, post conventional transpersonal development and exceptional abilities and the methods of cultivating them. A large body of research, several hundred studies on meditation alone suggest that meditation and yoga have effects ranging across psychology, physiology, biochemistry and can enhance both psychological health as well as physical health. And sometimes it can take physical and psychological health to the exceptional degree. This is the real pursuit of above the bottom line above the normal stage, above the coping and adjusting of life, it is much beyond that which is aimed at in the yogic tradition. And that is true in many traditions in the world as well, Sub certainly uh, Buddhist tradition also is one of them. So, what is this notion of self in the yoga? Notion of self in yoga can be derived, can be understood from the Panchakosha. Our self is not Panchakosha, world has all Panchakosha. We experience these koshas through the corresponding koshas of our self. There is a beautiful story in the Upanishad. A boy goes to a father, goes to a student, wants to understand the ultimate reality, the Paravidya, he is a pursuant of Paravidya, he is using, in, if in the Greek term we say, that is the universal order of things, which is the substratum of all of whatever is going on and visible uh, through the physical senses, he says, I wish to understand that. And Guru asks him to go back and reflect, he comes back, he says, food is the essence, because when I miss food, all cells of my body, all parts of my body were started craving for that. It cannot sustain without food. So, an is the Brahma and that is how the an was recognized as the expression of, as the expression of Brahma. Then the story goes on and the, the five koshas, the notion of five kosha, uh, notion of the five aspect of Brahma emerges. Adi Shankaracharya then systematized it and presented as notion of self. Nonetheless, uh, we will look at the 
a difference in the metaphysics of the Advaita Vedanta and the Sankhya uh, to some degree to understand and clarify this notion. So, we can understand the notion of self through the notion of Panchakosha as explained in the uh, as explained by Adi Shankaracharya and this is drawn from the uh, description given in the Upanishad. Our self is made up of or our self is constituted by Annamaya Kosh, Pranamaya Kosh, Manomaya Kosh, Vijnanamaya Kosh and Anandamaya Kosh. Physical body, energy body, emotional aspect of the body, rational aspect of the body and bliss aspect of the body. Physical body that is made up of an that is made up of food that is why perhaps it is called Annamaya Kosh. This is these are all the layers of the ultimate reality which is Brahman which is the real essence of the self, but we do not understand. So, we understand self as the small as self with the small s, but the tapas and sadhana is required to understand ourselves as the self with the capital S which is Brahman that Brahman that ultimate reality is enveloped through Anna that constitute the physical body through Prana which is called the energy body which is the reflected in the terms like subjective vitality C H I G in many traditions these terms are used in the Indian tradition Prana word, word is used. So, Pranamaya Kosh is nurtured by Prana Shakti and Pranayam is the process, the breathing exercises is the process of nurturing Pranamaya Kosh. Then there is a layer of Manomaya Kosh, emotional aspect of self, emotions, feelings, likes, dislikes, fears, phobia, these are all the daily life, daily mind that is called as daily mind. 